My name is Jennifer Sullivan, and we are here in the fourth of our 12 uh, series programs um, on the table with the Green Party. And um, I'd just like to welcome our guests today. We're going to be speaking about um, the problems that we have with the, um, the, the plant cannabis sativa being illegal. Now, our Green Party view is like this. The Green Party supports single-payer, universal health care, and a preventative care for all. We believe that health care is a right, not a privilege. We support the inclusion of a comprehensive rain, uh, range of health care services, including preventive care, dental vision, mental health, substance abuse, hospice, holistic health approaches, and alternative therapies, medical marijuana, long-term care, and expanded services for the mentally ill, differentially abled, and terminally ill. And um, another portion of this is we also call for um, repealing three strikes laws and the war on drugs and legalize possession and use of marijuana. Um, so we just get started giving that basic you know, point of view. It's pretty you know, straightforward. I'd like to introduce our guests. We'll start out with um, Eli. My name is Eli Zucker. I am a undergraduate of the University of South Florida my senior year. I am here representing the University of South Florida chapter of the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. And I hope to be able to get across that you don't need to partake in the use of marijuana to fight for those who need it due to medical problems such as cancer, glaucoma, ALS, Crohn's. I mean, the list goes on. But you don't have to smoke to be normal. My name is uh, John Beza. I'm a retired detective from the NYPD. Uh, I worked in narcotics and then I went into uh, the Manhattan Special Victim Squad. Um, I'm here with LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, and one of our mission statements is that we would like to have the legalization of marijuana and have it regulated and taxed. That's the official um, the stance of LEAP. And uh, it one of the things that I'd like to talk about, and we will uh, throughout this uh, show, is that uh, a plant should not be something that somebody is arrested for having, possessing, or using. Okay, next, Jesse. I'm Jesse Martinez. I represent Florida CAN, Florida Cannabis Action Network, and I'm a patient, not a criminal. I'm a disabled veteran, construction worker, and. Um, my interest is getting people medicine, getting them off pharmaceuticals. That's our biggest problem, I think. Okay, well, welcome, gentlemen, and uh, well, let's get started. Yeah, as we're speaking about, um, you know, the pharmaceuticals. Uh, what do you feel is more harmful in, uh, you know, taking chemical drugs or taking something that's like a natural substance? What's better, do you, in your opinion? The chemical drugs. Our bodies don't understand how to process these like they do natural ones. They force us to take the unnatural ones, and addiction rates are extreme. I've worked construction in Florida for 30 years, and to see all the kids and people who are injured and end up addicts instead of healthy, thriving people again. Okay, so basically something natural is taken in by our bodies in a better way with less consequences, less harm. Definitely less harm and less addiction. Okay. Um, yeah. We know that there's no addiction in cannabis. Yeah, it only makes sense. I and mean, we talk about, like, you know, we did talk about organic food, and I mean, it's just the things that are closer to nature are always better. The farther removed we get, the more we're getting out of our element as far as being human beings and being actual living organisms. Um, is there anything to say to that, John, that Detective well, Basil? I, th I think that. Uh, I, I agree. I mean, I think that uh, marijuana is a, is a plant that's here on Earth. Uh, you know, uh, people have used it for years and years and years, thousands of years, and uh, it, uh, it does not cause any overdoses. And if you look at the drug fact book or any other source, you will not find any overdose, of, uh, overdose deaths of marijuana. Um, so it is, uh, you know, in that aspect, it's relatively safe compared to, say, alcohol. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's what I would have to say about that type of thing. Okay. Yeah. I mean, for me, for me, it's a bit different. I had been on a very large amount of psychotropic medications at one point in time because, you know, I was depressed. I couldn't sleep. I was getting okay. bullied at school constantly. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I became addicted to those medications and it was one of the worst things in the world because I felt like I had no control over myself. The minute that I got off of those medications, I was actually able to function. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like if people actually desire something that's safer and has less known side effects than, you know, these pharmaceuticals, they should have the right to do that. You know, a person's body is a person's body and the right to health care should be a person's sovereign decision. It shouldn't be something that's dictated by, you know, the government. A marijuana gateway drug. Right. Okay. I went. I went through Dare as a child, and okay, you know, right. that was so you were kind heads. of indoctrinated you know, with that. Yeah. Um, it was a study done by uh, Thomas O'Connell and Shea Bumatar about uh, medical cannabis patients and other drug use, mm -hmm. and throughout their entire study, it showed that rather than marijuana acting as a gateway to other drugs, it actually exerted a positive benefit on the people's lives because rather than being subject to medications that would make them, you know, doped up and, you know, out of it, mm -hmm. they had access to something that didn't have a serious of a backlash on them. So they were able to still continue, you know, their job, whatever it may be. They were still able to enjoy their family. Mm -hmm. You know, the marijuana didn't take away from their life, which is something that we see being pushed onto us in this, you know, generation. With mm -hmm. the war on drugs, it's always been, you know, Marijuana will destroy your family. It fries your brain. Kind of like that movie, uh, marijuana was marijuana madness or something. Which was like if I ever saw a cornball piece of, <laughs> you know, <laughs> filming, that was it. It was just like a little over the top there, um, you know. And I think that again, we're going back to the thing is like if you, uh, you know, puff them. I've heard of that group, right? If you take a puff or two, if people do, um, you know, it's different than smoking something all day long. I mean, that's so, yeah, the chemicals are a lot more powerful. They're a lot more concentrated. And God knows, like you were saying, what's in them. So um, well, what do you feel about that as far as a gateway drug, Detective Basil? I, I don't believe at all that marijuana is a gateway drug. Um, I believe that if you, if you make that argument, I think you can make the same argument for um, alcohol, for caffeine, because any heroin, cocaine, marijuana user has used, has uh, had soda before, or soda pop, or has had water. I mean, you know, a gateway drug, it's very easy to say something is a gateway drug. Right. But uh, in fact, alcohol, uh, you know, you can make that same argument, but I don't believe that argument at all either. I believe that a person makes a choice mm -hmm. based on their, and that's their personal choice, based on their desire and what they want to do. Um, and they shouldn't be, you know, uh, uh, made. They shouldn't be uh, put in jail for a choice they want to make, want to because they want to smoke uh, a piece of a plant yes. or something like that's that. How, that's really how ridiculous it is. I mean, and it's just, yeah, is this this is like this killer plant or something, and it's actually beneficial to a lot of people. And they've proven that it is. Uh, that cigarettes are far more addicting. Nicotine is far more addicting than just about any substance on the planet. So plus all these things that they throw in it that they don't even have to put in tobacco. If they had natural tobacco, it would be safer than what they actually sell on the market. Oh, we yeah. use the word addiction. Cannabis is not addicted. You okay. can habitualize yourself to it. Just Very like well. exercising, Better. we're not Sorry. addicted to exercising. We can habitualize ourselves mm -hmm. to it. Yes. But it's not addiction. There is right. no addiction to cannabis. Ah. Yeah. So it's yeah. So when basically when we're, we're saying that we're we're just basically reiterating the fact that um, depending on how you look at a term, right? You know, well, it's the but, words that they've used to keep us trapped in this mindset for these so many years. Yes, and really, it, what is it? I think the statistic is seventy-two percent of Americans think that it should be legal, right. not just medical marijuana, but just legal across legal. the board. And that, I think, is, is America ages and, we, you know, people that, are, you know, actually believe the propaganda about how dangerous it was are, are seeing that. Um, and now, you were in the, the Cold War, you were stationed in Germany, you said, at the border of what? Czechoslovakian border. I was on border patrol there. Okay. And did you experience, did you feel like you experienced PTSD there, or is it more that you've experienced that when you've been working with veterans? Um, more with veterans. Okay. You so see it a it. lot in the veterans today. Um, and some of our soldiers are from Vietnam are still suffering a well, lot. Well, yeah. If you There's... spend five minutes at the veterans hospital, it's pretty sad to see yeah. the state. Well, you were one of the lucky ones as far as that, go I mean, if, you know, as far as military being stationed there. Yes, ma'am. Was more civilized situation. Yes. 
danger potential. Potential but, of danger, but definitely no danger. Not, not like our soldiers are facing today. Not with the, the, and the IEDs. Trauma they're facing. And our soldiers uh, are facing a lot more trauma and direct to overexposure to it these days, I think, is the main thing that's causing the PTSD. And then they're not allowed to use anything but the psychotropic drugs that we know are addictive and harmful. Yeah. And it's not helping any of our soldiers. No, it's not helping our soldiers. It is helping the pharmaceutical corporations that like to donate to our political candidates that are running for office. Right. And the crisis hotline stay busy. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, <laughs> so I mean, it's one of those things we've got to see, like, is, you know, it's one thing to have job creation, but let's make clean and healthy job creation. Let's make sustainable well, job creation. So you, you know, PTSD, we'll get back to that, is like the veterans. So if they have PTSD in Florida, they got a problem. They got a problem. As opposed to the ones that are in California. You want to explain? The ones in California and states, the other 13 that I think are legal medically right like now. Michigan. Yes, yeah, so you can receive it for PTSD. And the chances of uh, recovery are so much better uh, compared to addiction. Yeah, because you've compounded always. the problem. Exactly. And to think that you can serve our country no matter what state you're in and go put your life on the line. But you come back to the United States, you have to find another state to live in to be treated. Yeah. And, you know, as far as you've, you, now your experience, Detective Mesa, when you um, had situations where you were arresting people and you've, they found, you know, some marijuana in their possession, did you find these people like were very violent criminals? Did they resist arrest? Or did you find, maybe in the experience, what? It all, it all depended on what neighborhood okay. uh, you know, I worked in. Mm -hmm. uh, well, if I worked in the, in, a, in the ghetto where I did most of my career, mm -hmm. uh, it was, you know, it's an underground industry. Okay. So there have been times, you know, the, the, it wasn't, they weren't using marijuana. It was the trade itself that would make it violent. Okay, so the, the dealers. It would be the dealers, not the users. The if, if you gave me a choice to go to a call where people were having a loud party who were smoking marijuana or going to a call where people had a loud party and were drinking alcohol, for safety purposes, I choose the, the marijuana every okay. time. Okay. And I think yeah. any sane cop or any cop worth his salt would say the same thing. They're more relaxed. I mean, yes. I've, I've heard the thing where people like when they're driving, it's like when they're people drink and drive, they're like flooring it and they think that, you know, they're, it's like a like an upper or something, whereas people that smoke marijuana don't even want to drive, they just want to stay home. <laughs> so, <laughs> as far as that goes, um, any comments on that, Eli? I mean, I don't know. I, I agree with. Um, I agree with what you said about how it's more so risk that drives people to become violent with marijuana. You know, it's, from what I see, it's normal's mission to try to educate people about the real facts of marijuana, because there's a lot of misinformation out there. Awesome. You know, with all due, you know, respect and deference to Attorney General Bondi, you know, her saying that, you know, the new petition would lead to marijuana use in limitless situations uh -huh. is far from the truth. Everything is put out there in the bill. You know, it's this kind of misinformation that leads people to think that, oh, these people who want to smoke marijuana, they're bad people. They're trying to, you know, corrupt the fabric Derelict. of society. Yeah. yeah. Most of these people are just responsible adults. You know, they're mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, teachers, you know, cashiers at the supermarket. They, they aren't doing it because they want to abuse it. They're doing it because they, they, you know, they view it as a safe alternative. Mm -hmm. They view it as something that, you know, isn't going to be as taxing on their body as we would consider, you know, alcohol or, mm -hmm. you know, caffeine alert pills. Right. And, you know, and I work for the U.S. government for, you know, for the last 14 or so years, and I can't do any drugs, and I can be tested at any time. So, it, you know, it's, it's not, I see it as like, I am not looking for myself, but I'm looking for freedom in this United States, freedom of choice. And again, I don't see where this is a problem. Our, our, my political party does not see where this is a problem. I feel that the prohibition of it is a bigger problem. It's sort of like Mills's harm principle. If you're doing something in your own house, you're not harming anyone else outside of your house, the government should have no need to come in and you know stop you from doing it. If you're doing something that's irresponsible and affecting people and society as a whole, then you know of course that's something that you could actually go and stop a person from doing. You know, but if you're just sitting in your own house smoking, 
you know, there's really no problem with that. You're in your own house. You yeah, know. so it's, it's a victimless crime, as they say. I mean, I'd like to think that it would be a victimless crime, but, you know, then there are people who do it irresponsibly, and then it becomes a crime with victims. Well. The only way for us to really be able to move forward and to get people to recognize that this isn't as bad is to provide, you know, factual education. Right. Yes. I, I believe if you don't have a victim, it's not a crime. I mean, that's, that's what I believe. Right. Not, yeah, if, my exactly. personal opinion is right. if you don't have a victim, it's not a crime. Okay. And they have had us talk about, you know, that it's a victimless crime. And, and that, that's kind of what we were talking about before about the language they got us mm -hmm. using. They have mm -hmm. us using right. it to do this. And really, it's, it's what you want to put into your own body. Uh, as long as you don't aggress or hurt anybody else, as he was just saying, there should not be a problem with that. Um, but what happens is, you know, uh, government, they, they want to, you know, have that camera into our houses and our bedrooms and everything else. And also the fact that people in the government are making money off of this. And this like illegal the, trade is what... Uh, the DEA, in other words, what, to work uh, for the DEA or what? The, what do you D mean? the DEA, the FBI, every police department in this country is making money off of the drug war and one of the things that would happen immediately if you ended the drug war would be the all these tanks and these lucrative uh, you know deals that they get with the federal government all the money it would shrink up because you wouldn't have this underground trade uh, of right. drugs and if you're just specifically talking about marijuana you know that alone would yes. would, would drop our, our, pro our crime if you will would, would drop uh, the underground crime any any because there are no court systems between say a marijuana dealer here and a marijuana dealer here you, there are no court systems so how do they fight out their problems they fight it out between each other right um, if, if necessary now I don't see that so much in marijuana as I do in other drugs but that's yeah. basically what we have here yeah and, it, and well so basically it's militarizing our police then you're saying yeah militarizing our police and our police are not focusing anymore on real crime and what i'm talking about is i work in sex crimes with sure. where i talk child abuse sexual homicide rape and far worse the, far worse those those i had a squad that worked manhattan we had over four or five thousand cases a year we had 22 detectives assigned to all those cases at the same time in manhattan north just the north manhattan had over three four hundred detectives doing buy and bust on the street while i sat with a pile of cases this high of child abuse and very horrible rape cases. Right. So the the manpower it has it's it's shifted and it's because of money. I mean, money drives the world, but it's because of money and you know uh, bad policy, obviously. Right. Right. So yeah, and it is is scary to see the the police getting involved and like that. I mean, it, it, we were talking about this last week with we were talking about nuclear, and you know that's the NRC. That's their job to regulate nuclear. So if we stop using nuclear, they're out of a job. But is it a really a sustainable, healthy job? I mean, we can create better jobs and the rebuilding our infrastructure. And now, if we we talk about if we don't have the DEA working on marijuana, but they're still working on other things that could be, you know, a lot more addictive things, a lot more dangerous things. You know, like what the heroin trade, or if that was their that was their focus, maybe they wouldn't need as many people. And maybe we wouldn't have as many privatized prisons, you know, in this country, but the other jobs could be working with, like in Colorado, they're finding that they are taxing it. And has anybody got information on what's going on in Colorado right now? About $5 million in the first week. Yes. They made $5 million tax revenue? I, yeah. I've heard that, like other states are going, whoa. <laughs> yes, but, you know, then you run into the problem, you know, since the federal government has it under Schedule 1, you know, the the growers and the dispensaries can't deposit the money into the banks because the banks are afraid that if they take the money then it's going to be you know money laundering because it's still illegal they can only do that for like people at wall street i guess <laughs> but, it seems you know we put something yeah. in the cayman islands or swiss banks but now we can't take right. this because it's a schedule one drug you know and it's just it's going to end up where the dispensaries might end up putting it into you know offshore accounts you never know because you know they're gonna have all this money there and it can't just be sitting there it's a huge risk well yeah you can't put five million bucks in your you know can't put it into a sock and hide it underneath the bed like, <laughs> exactly they're trying to make a move to make a banking system just for 
the oh. industry. <clears throat> yeah, like a, well, so they can protect themselves. That's one of the things the Green Party likes is like state banks. Let's get rid of these investment banks. Let's not stop. Well, you know, we're supposed to have the, you know, the uh, uh, Glass-Steagall Act where we separated, you know, investment banks from, you know, from the, the banks that were just like for, you know, for people. And, you know, and so the high risk is taken out of, you know, so you don't have to worry about a bank being too big to fail. You're just, you know, dealing with, you have my money. It's, you know, FDIC protected insurance. So, yeah. Uh, and if you if you look if you look at constitutionally uh -huh. if you look at this you will I like see the Constitution. if you look I like the Constitution too and <laughs> if you look at it I mean I'm going to make two points here one is under Article One Section Eight mm -hmm. there and, and uh, under anywhere in the in Constitution you're not going to find a place that authorizes the DEA the FBI um, the IRS well the IRS is Sixteenth Amendment but yeah. uh, you know these agencies especially to have an arm there you know we have three hundred thousand uh, armed agents in the government. I mean, even NASA has armed agents. So, I mean, that 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 is you know just ridiculous in and of itself. But when we talk about Colorado, let's talk about what a federalism. We have turned federalism on its head. Federalism being that the states, uh, you know, have are we're supposed to be the powerful ones, and it was supposed to be a skeletal federal government. Well, we've turned that around completely, and that's why now we we're concerned about the DEA coming into Colorado or causing problems with the banks, and we shouldn't really have to worry about that. But again, as some politicians say, the Constitution is just a piece of paper. In hmm. my own personal viewpoint, you know, I, I've, I've looked over the Controlled Substances Act. There's nothing in there that says that the president needs to really go through Congress to be able to take marijuana off of Schedule One. Mm -hmm. all, all they need is the head of the Department of Health and Human Services and the Attorney General. They could bypass it. Mm -hmm. They could be giving this medicine to people who are sick and dying and who need it. You know, Kathy Jordan down here in Florida, she suffers from ALS. You know, oh. she needs this. You know, she shouldn't have to fear about going to jail because it's a medication that can help maintain her quality of life. Right. You know, the federal government, you know, and this is, you know, by myself because I'm not sure if, you know, my organization would identify with this 100%, but the federal government shouldn't really be governing this. It should be something that's left up to the states because then the states have to ask the people and it's the people's voice that would make the decision, you know. If the federal government wants to tax it, that's fine. I can understand that. You know, I wouldn't mind an excise tax on it because then it would help to reduce our national deficit. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as far as maintaining, you know, a decision over other people's choices, you know, it, it just it really doesn't make sense. Why should, you know, myself or any of my friends have to worry about being arrested and sentenced to a mandatory minimum of 10 years just for doing something that's, that's not really That's what it is now, 10 else. years mandatory minimum. Well, okay. it goes up as high as 25 years to life, you know, well, it differs for, from state to state. For how much? I mean, do you have to have a pound or what? I think... I think it was anything underneath 28 grams or what would be considered an ounce is an ounce. about one to two years mandatory minimum okay. sentence. And it's hard for the judges to do anything else other than the direct mandatory minimum. So really, they can't, with their discretion and someone's first... You know, like if it's a first offense, it's a first offense. You know, maybe switch it to something like a day fine. Right. You know, rather than spending, what, you know, three, maybe four thousand dollars per prisoner per year. Right. You know, maybe just have it be like a twenty or forty dollar fine per ounce. You know, I'm pretty sure that the person would rather pay the forty dollars than go to jail, and you know, it would help make revenue for the states. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that we just need some common sense in some of our laws. I mean, you see someone recklessly driving, not even you know, just they're a teenager and they don't have experience, let's say, or even a you know, ninety year old person that can't see real well and they're driving, they can't hear it. I mean, they're on the road and they could cause an accident, kill someone. And yet there's like a, you know, basically a, a fine, you're done, you know, you get a ticket. And then something like this where you're just, you know, walking around, you're not selling it or whatever. Um, but I want to get back to you because you know, Kate, you brought up Kathy Jordan with ALS and you know her personally. You want to say a few things about that, please, Jesse? Um, sure. Um, especially right now, Kathy just did a trip out to Colorado mm -hmm. where she um, spoke um, there to a large group of people. And... Um, they're using it for these children that are having seizures. They know it works. The CBDs work great for children with seizures. They don't know how it works. Kathy's been using it since the 80s. Okay. She knows how it works in her brain. She said the first time she smoked it, she felt her ALS stop progressing. 
Okay. Now ALS is that's Lou Gehrig's Lou disease, Gehrig's okay, disease right. as the, we the most famous know. Famous baseball. Okay, but go ahead. So ALS is what is it? I mean, what is it? Um, what it's done yeah. to her is really taking her mobility away. But as far as her life, she's got more life than most people I know, and the smartest and strongest person I know. Very lucid. Very lucid. And when she uses cannabis, you can hear her voice pick up. Her excitement level picks up. She can talk stronger. She, you can understand what she says. It alleviates a lot of the things that are so going the wrong with her. The problems, you can see them instantly go away with her and to see her fight when they are killing us with these prescriptions and not first do no harm. That's, Exa their, that's their motto. That's the Hippocratic Oath for doctors. First do no harm. Rather than give people a whole bunch of you know things, medicines and stuff, if, if there's a way to like cure someone either you know the natural substance or you know or just bide your time don't take anything and just let it go you know whatever it is but you know yeah it would be definitely the thing would be like something that's actually beneficial to be the first thing a doctor would recommend but they can't because their hands are tied because they would actually go I don't know what the fine would be for a doctor if they prescribe it in a state where it, you can't I mean they would go would they be considered like a drug dealer or what would they any, any thoughts? They won't hear it. They won't, they won't hear it. Just, I was it's not on, happening. I was on 29 prescriptions. I should say addicted to most of 29 prescriptions a day. Well, and you're not now? For 15 years. Awesome. Um, I went to California and seen a doctor out there, and he recommended cannabis for everything I was taking a prescription for. Mm -hmm. um, went off of the prescriptions, cleaned myself out up there started a cannabis regiment and not smoked cannabis, an oral tincture made from cannabis, which has none of the euphoric um, attributes that most okay. people use it for, but the pain relief, the benefits for no more psychotropic medicines for anxiety issues that I had. Um, Miraculous. And apparently you can function real well because now you're doing volunteer work and you also bought, bought yourself some property in Mendocino, California. You got a farm in Mendocino, well, California. Yes, ma'am. I'm trying. You're, you're, I want to learn investments. How. I mean, it, obviously you're, you're not foggy. No, ma'am. <laughs> it's about yeah. making medicine and getting yes. medicine back to people the way it should be. Okay. Well, and, I, and I'm looking at this. This is uh, Florida Veterans for Cannabis. Um, and what this is, it's talking about the health benefits of medical cannabis. Cannabis is known to alleviate the symptoms of the following, post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury, and that's big things for veterans, um, uh, amyotropic trophic lateral sclerosis, which is ALS, okay, ALS, <laughs> <laughs> depression, anxiety, AIDS, cancer, chronic pain, epilepsy, glaucoma, I know that's a well-known, and multiple sclerosis. Deaths related to cannabis use, zero. So, boy, even if it was just one of those things that it was helping with, I mean, wouldn't that make sense? And you can't forget irritable bowel syndrome and inflammatory okay. bowel disease, too. Okay. People I, with I find something interesting about that differently because I'm a, a retired cop. But right. when, you, when we say no deaths, there are, there are no deaths or no overdoses, but the deaths come into play when the government gets involved. So when they shoot when, someone. When the, nowadays, if you, if you see, they'll, they'll be, you know, they'll raid a house because there's 10 plants in there. They happen to be marijuana plants, there's 10 plants. They go in, they have helmets on, they have a tank. There'll be towns of 1,000 people that have this tank that's been given to them by the, 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 the army, and they use it like it warriors. They jump in and they end up, in, you know, typically somebody ends up getting hurt, and most Mostly it's, uh, you know, uh, the innocent people. Right. And, uh, you know, somebody gets shot over a marijuana plant. And it's, it's going it's over the top. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and I actually know someone that's in a situation. It's a child custody dispute, and the father is, does not use drugs, but the mother married someone that was arrested for, you know, has been busted five times, and it was cocaine and cannabis. But, but the thing is, is that being that it's an, illegal substance at this time, even if it is not harmful. I mean, if it was carrots and they were illegal and you had to get your carrots at a drug dealer's house, at a criminal's house, where they're going to, because of carrots being dangerous and, and so forth to, 
you know, against the law that to get those carrots, they had to keep guns on hand, you know, so that no one would steal their carrots. So, I mean, that's the same situation. Like, you've got this small child, so this father, you feel that that's a legitimate concern in your experience that a small child living in a home like that, a drug deal gone bad, or if they just go in and bust in with their, you know, their militarized uh, department. I mean, that's a, a, that's a real danger for a little child. Yes, it is. It's yeah. danger. It's You've a danger seen, for everybody. Yeah, I'm well, yeah, yeah, I mean, and I'm not just saying it's right, but only but, small but children. Child, yeah, small children are involved, and we, we see this more and more, and especially since people are uh, videotaping with their phones and the iPhones and so forth, we see this more and more. We see that the police just harming people over a plant. And that's my whole thing, is you just, the police have to understand, and the government has to understand, you can't mess with desire. If somebody has a desire to use something, whether it's for medical purposes or not, you can't stop that. Right, and a consenting adult. I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's a difference there, too, is that, you know, I'm, I, when I say I see some kids behind the barns, I'm not saying, you know, I'm, but, I, but as, as adults going to purchase something, they should be able to do that and make up their own decisions. It seemed to work well in the Netherlands. That's one of the most highly functioning com countries in the world. Um, so, and the, you know, the, the, the wages are real good there and, and things. So it's not like the, this country isn't functioning. Um, so We seem to lump the cannabis users in with drug users. And it's only right. because the illegality of it that right. they get linked because most people in the cannabis culture really are far away from the drug culture. Right, that's their you know? only connection yes. is the fact that yes. yeah, if it wasn't they could go to the that, store, they'd rather. Right, so their biggest uh, enemy or biggest danger is really law enforcement. The only deaths, like you said, caused from law enforcement raiding you or overzealously. And, and it, yeah, go ahead. I'm Actually, bringing up harm with the police is something very interesting. Um, have you guys heard about the Deming, New Mexico case of David Eckert? No. Mr. Eckert was driving through a Walmart parking lot. He got stopped. I believe it was for, you know, not stopping at a stop sign. And the police officer brings him out, asks if you know, he could search the car. He says, sure, that's no problem. The second that he tried to ask if he could search his person, you know, Mr. Eckert, naturally, like I think most of us would, you know, I'm sorry, but you're going to need to get a warrant for that. They bring the dr an uncertified drug dog out, sniff the car, and the dog alerts to drugs on the front seat. They took Mr. Eckert to the Deming Regional Medical Center to try to do a full body cavity search. The doctors there said no because it's unethical. They drove him across county lines, performed three bimanual examinations, three forced enemas, two x-rays and a colonoscopy, all with an invalid warrant. You know, the illegality of it is causing these police to become so overzealous in trying to get some sort of conviction. Right. You know, I mean, I can only imagine what he must have gone through, you know, having to, you know, defecate in front of officers because, you know, like, oh, he has drugs, he has drugs, he has drugs. Overzealous, yeah. I mean, you I... Know, and it's just like, you have these no-knock raids. There was a Marine who, he was shot 30 no times. No-knock, so, meaning no, don't yeah, knock Yeah, just like, door, you know, bust in. bam, door goes open. You know, you think someone's breaking into your house, you're going to try to... Without go a warrant. Of, well, no, with a warrant. They got a warrant, but, okay. You know, it's still like a no-knock raid. You know, you okay. hear someone smack in your door. First thing is someone's breaking protect into the house. house. I need to protect myself. I need to protect my family. You know, you shouldn't be worried about police breaking into your house and shooting you 30 times. And then asking questions. Yeah. Yeah. But overzealous. Because, you know, I'm a peace and justice advocate. And I have to say that, you know, I, I like to think of, we need police. We need the, a peace officer. I have had, I have had interactions with police before that have been so wonderful. They've been so, such great people. They're really trying to do their job, do it right. And then you do get the ones. Just, it's just like any kind of field where you're going to find the bad apples and stuff. But this is where someone could really, um, you know, they, they watch too many Arnold Schwarzenegger films or something and they just think, I'm going to be this badass guy and get out there and just, you know, tear into this house and get these people and it's their to get their uh, jollies off? <laughs> you know, I don't think it's to get their jollies off, though, Just, you know, with all due Their respect. convictions? They're, okay, well, I but mean, I'm, some might. Like, you have the, you know, the privatization of the prison system. It might not be, oh, okay. you know, it might not be latent, you know, 
oh, I want to blow stuff up, I want to smash in doors. Okay. You know, they could very well be getting pressured by their higher ups to maintain a quota of drugs. Ah, uh, yeah, like, like, okay, tickets. You know, because quota. there have been articles published on the internet where these private prisons are, you know, making state sign contracts. If you're at X capacity or below, we have the right to sue you. You know, it leads to discriminatory, uh, discriminatory yeah. practices, discriminatory searches. Okay. You, know. you could speak to that. I mean, you, have you run into them where they were saying quotas to you as a detective, or was that more like for just Well, I was in narcotics, so of okay. course there were quotas. But so you were in narcotics. I was just undercover. Ah. I mean, complete, no, ah. real undercover where okay. you didn't have your ID or your shield. Your Got badge. you. Oh, okay. And I didn't make arrests. In other words, ah. I didn't make buys, but I wouldn't make arrests. Got you. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it was clearly, it was for that and for overtime, let's face it. Uh, okay. but, but clearly, you had to have your numbers. Right. And, uh, you know, it depended on where you worked, too. If you worked in a slow area, yeah, marijuana arrests were a, uh, a big deal. Something you, you could do to yeah, pump up the you, volume. But if you, worked in a, if you worked in a very busy area, in a ghetto mm -hmm. area, um, marijuana wasn't so, wasn't really the target because it would be looked at as, oh, that's a, almost a waste of time. The, and what I, what I say is, I'm not saying that other cops aren't real cops, but when you work in the ghetto, you kind of realize what priorities are. Mm -hmm. And marijuana is a very low priority. T typically it was. Mm -hmm. Now we have a whole new generation of police officers that are coming on. No longer is it, um, I became a cop because my father was a fireman, my two grandfathers were cops. So I became a cop not just to have the, the shield, the badge, and the gun and everything. Mm -hmm. I became a cop generational. Traditional. traditional. Right. Uh, nowadays you don't have that. You have people coming back from the war and they become police officers and... With PTSD. With PTSD. And mm -hmm. all they want to do is ride around on tanks and shoot people and or have the opportunity to... They were in, yeah, they were I, in these situations and, where yes. that was the norm. And, and when, I, when I worked in the ghetto, you know, I worked there, there were 70 homicides a year in one square mile, and I'll tell you this much, uh, a couple of cops were shot, but not one, when I worked there, again, three and a half years, not one police officer shot a, what we call a bad guy. We mm -hmm. would typically, you would not want to shoot somebody, you'd tackle them. Right. I mean, really, that's well, what that I Well, that would be worked. the better thing. I, I guess I've always thought that police being, you know, expert marksmen, that rather than shoot to kill, they would shoot to, in, you know, like disable, like if someone's got a gun in their hand, shoot the gun out of their hand. If someone's running away, shoot their leg. I mean, you know what I mean? As opposed to, like, go for the heart. Um, but, you know, or extra bullets that, they, you know, they was like, well, let's shoot them 30 times, you know, like, uh, but... Um, but yeah, I mean, and you were also saying about um, the difference between, and we're, we're getting a different thing, but as far as like minorities suffer more with the drug bus, yes. because this, this is the thing with the, the crack and powder cocaine. Right. When I was there, when it was the pr proliferation of crack cocaine, it was just mm -hmm. all over the place. Um, but if you were caught selling crack cocaine, you were given a higher sense, even in the, in the right. state, right. Um, as opposed to powder cocaine, uh -huh. where, and typically powder cocaine, the users would be typically um, white, could be middle class, upper middle class. Right, right. It, it, it could be so anybody, could really, but that more so than refined. a community where I work was 99.9% was .9 black, and that community would face tougher sentences over this. So it's um, racially biased, it's, so it's a it's good way to biased, like. It's racially biased, and I'm, I have to show some optimism in this whole conversation, that, they are. that now we have at least so two people, two senators from different parties, at least right. coming together and talking about a, a, a change in this system. And you have mm -hmm. judges talking about it, too. So you yeah. have a guy like Cory Booker, uh -huh. uh, yes. who's a Democrat in New Jersey. And you have yeah, a guy like guy. Rand Paul, who's a, a Republican in, in Kentucky. And you take them and put them together, and at least it's optimistic. I have some optimism. Right, and we get some green people, green party people elected. will be <laughs> will even be better because yeah, yeah, because it's really it's it's all about justice, it's all about what's fair, and you know. But that's so we're really looking at something that is kind of a there's an incentive to make arrests, and it's feeding the system. And I'm looking at some statistics here. The number of Americans behind bars in 2009 in federal, state, and local prisons. Um, is 2,424,279 or one in every 99 um, of adults. So it's um, 99. I, I guess this is the highest incarceration rate in the world. And I, I feel like that's going down the wrong trail, isn't it, for a country that's supposed to be about freedom? For nonviolent crimes. Yes, and for, no, right, <laughs> for nonviolent crimes. Again, yeah, let's, let's make it clear a that. A crime we're against no one. 
I mean, as a criminology student, we're taught about the okay. labeling theory. Mm -hmm. If you label someone as a criminal, nine times out of ten, they're more likely to do things that identify with their label. You mm -hmm. know, you label someone a deviant, they're going to partake in deviant behavior. You label someone a criminal, they're going to participate in criminal behavior. You're throwing these nonviolent marijuana smokers into prisons with rapists, arsonists, murderers. And they they're going to learn. They go through prisonization. They don't know any other life other than, you know, what's inside the walls. They come out, they can't cope with it. You know, they're going to return to their behavior more likely than not because they're like, oh, I'm a criminal. Mm -hmm. I have nothing else to do. No one's going to want to hire me because, you know, I'm that a criminal. Label. Yeah. And, and, and it's like felony. So felony and then they can't vote and it's, it's just like they've become a non-person really. You take their life that. and liberty away. Yeah. It's, it's something. And, you know, here's a quote. Um, let's see if you can guess who said this. We've got to take a look at what we're considering crimes. I'm not exactly for the use of drugs, don't get me wrong, but I just think criminalizing marijuana, criminalizing the possession of a few ounces of pot, is costing us a fortune, ruining young people who go into prisons as youths and come out hardened criminals. Guess who said that? <laughs> Anybody? Okay. <laughs> Pat Robertson. From the Christian Broadcasting Network. So, you know, while I think some, some of the things he says are kind of off the wall, that one, I have to say, right, it you know, right on mark. It, it's on the money. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, this, we're talking about young people's lives that even if it was, and we know it isn't, we're pretty, there's all this proof that given there's, you know, no one's died from it. No, it's not addictive. It's, you know, the, it's, it's a, not harming anybody else, but they go into prison and do a minimum of 10 years and come out like, you know, there are people they've known for the last 10 years. You know, let's say they go in at age 19, they're in their 29, so a third of their life has been spent in, with criminals, that's their peer group. And so that's, you know, it's spot on that they would be, you're, we're training them to be more criminalized, whereas if anything, if there is that tendency, like, like we're, the, you were saying too, the fact that they did have an addictive personality and they were abusing something. I mean, that's that's a different category than just someone that just you know that's like it. that tries something or just happens to be caught. I mean, it just it just seems like it's over the top and, and it's a plant that's more been of a used. Problem than yeah. Go it's ahead. It's a plant that's been used as a medicine for thousands of years. Um, ancient China, ancient Egypt. We know it was used for things like menstrual cramps and pain as far back then. Mm. So to think that we're more civilized and we're throwing people in prison for using a plant, and we know now maybe people's intentions weren't to medicate when they used it, but people are medicating every time they use it, whether they realize it or not. Mm -hmm. If it weren't for it, we'd have more people on these psychotropic drugs, more people on these addictive pain medicines. So. We need to find a way to get people back to real medicine, not poison, and just look at our ancestors. When did, it was in our pharmacological books until when? I, you might have a better idea was on that. Was it the 30s, 40s? In 37, they made it illegal okay. with the tax laws. Yeah. But it was in the pharmacological books until sometime in the 40s. So it was still considered medicine in our countries until the 40s. Right. So it's only the past... 50 or 60 years that it's been so demonized right. that we will kill our youth or put them in prison for their and ruin their lives for a medicinal plant. Right, exactly. No matter what they were using it for. And the thing is, is that if it's, in, I guess that's another point that I find from the justice aspect. You have young, you know, teenage kids. Their parents say, don't use it, and then they try it anyway, because that's how kids are. You say, don't jump a fence, I'll jump, you know. So you, they try it, and they find out, well, this isn't bad. So then what do they do? They end up going to stronger things. They could be in that situation, or in a, in a situation, like I was saying before, where they, you know, they're, in, they're going to a criminal's house that's selling it, knowingly selling something illegal in large quantities and taking that risk to make money, um, and also probably having something a lot more addicting like Oxycontin, so I always say it, Oxycontin, whatever. <laughs> anyway, that is a lot more addicting. And so they have that also. You know, it's not just that they're, you know, so they have this and this. And so they give the, the kids, oh, let's try this Oxycontin. And then they end up addicted to that. And there's a lot. There's a big problem in this state 
a lot of kids are addicted to that, and young people are addicted, and older people too, middle-aged women, and, and they do crimes from that, and it's not so... And when you over-regulate, okay, mm -hmm. and that includes prescription drugs, when you over-regulate something, there will always be a black market. Overregulate to the point of where we have things that are illegal, or overregulate to the point where we have, you know, prescriptions for certain medications or whatever that are addicting. You are going to have a black market, and you will have crime, and you will have people die over it. And that is what really bothers me about the whole, you know, the whole deal with marijuana. It's just, it, it's, it, it's an absurdity to me. But there are people who will be, uh, who will sit there and say. Uh, we can't have this, we can never have this, but things, times are changing. They right. are changing, I will tell you that. And I, I, I am, like I said, I have to remain optimistic. I don't know yeah, let, yeah let's back this truck up and let's get back to like common sense. And I mean, I, I noticed your tie and that's George Washington yes, on is. your tie. Yes, it is George Washington. I went to Mount Vernon and he had a big, you know, he had a big plantation mm -hmm. and there was all sorts of crops and one of his crops was hemp. Correct. And I guess that's another point is the industrial hemp versus cannabis sativa. Anyone want to speak to that? I believe that hemp is the one biofuel that can make the United States energy independent. Ah, like yes. We're, we're talking about a miracle plant that could be used for cotton, paper, you know, it's, I'm trying to remember the guy's name. He's in Tarpon Springs and he's actually making houses out of what he calls hempcrete. Which you know maintains hemp better crete. Hemp like crete concrete, oh, okay. concrete using hemp, yeah. Okay. You know, and it's just it's it's insane because you have something here that could be mass produced, you know, even under you know duress. I guess we could say you know from different weather conditions. Right. You know, it's, it's, it, it, it makes needs low. It's low water, and it's, it's opposed like corn for crops or for fuel legal, is high water intensity, which is almost more of the problem. If we legalize hemp nationwide, think about how many jobs that would create. We'd have people working, you know, on the farms, bringing it in, refining it. It just, it really doesn't make sense. Plus, hemp doesn't really have any psychoactive material, if I, you know, remember correctly. Yeah, and we could, right, yeah, it doesn't, and that's, the, that's industrial hemp, so they're the same plant family, but the amount of anything, you know, that would be... It's negligible. Yeah, right. yeah. Is there, yeah, it's not. Uh, what did you say? You had to smoke a tree of it? Or? You got to smoke a telephone pole. <laughs> Size. Yeah. Like a high elf of it. But the point is, I mean, this is the indoctrination that we were talking about and you were exactly. talking about before, mm -hmm. is that because the plant looks like a marijuana plant, and that shouldn't even be an issue, but let's yeah. just say it is. That right, right. It looks like a marijuana that, that's, that's it. It's no good. We can't have it. Canada has it. We have to import it from Canada. Now yeah. I know they're working on it in uh -huh. Kentucky. They're working on something to try to get hemp legalized in Kentucky and New Jersey too. And to New Jersey to bring jobs in. Yeah, and what, what were you going to say? Something? All of our farmers, we're in a state right now where American farmers are disappearing rapidly. Tobacco was farmed so heavily in this part of the country yes. and it grows perfectly everywhere tobacco grows. It's so our farmers crop. are set up to grow it. It's an easy crop to grow. And the government still says it that they didn't logic. put out, uh, they put out a movie during World War II to grow hemp for our farmers again because we needed it we for the road. We needed it for the war effort. But then <laughs> but, when the war but, is over. <laughs> but they still refuse to admit that they even produced the film. Oh, okay. yeah. I remember, I remember actually seeing that. Yeah, and that's, it just, just defies logic. It's just like this. I guess unless, unless you're a corporate executive in a pharmaceutical corporation that says, boy, you know, that would really throw us out, you know, for a loop. Our profits would go down to be negligible because, you know, given the choice of taking something that's not addictive and something that is known as addictive, it they're going to choose the, the non-addictive and we're not going to be able to sell our product. And, you know, that they're very much, if you look at opensecrets.org, you can see how much money they give to candidates. And then you can go to thomas.gov and see how those candidates, they're getting the money. There are people in, that have been elected with all this drug money um, that they, they come in and vote to, you know, subsidize these drug corporations for their research. They have universities do studies, so our students, we're paying at a public university for these students to do these studies, and then the, they turn them over to a corporation that could do something with it. And it's just like, wait a minute, they should have done their own research, but, but uh, you're, you're, yeah. We you're have to start talking to change people's mindset. I have a friend who is a farmer, uh -huh. a Florida farmer. Gener many generations of his family have farmed in Florida. His name is Donnie Clark. Okay. He's known famous for Mayaka Gold, which okay. is um, 
he was arrested in the 80s okay. for growing cannabis ah. out in Mayaka State okay. Park area. That's a beautiful park. He was given life in prison. and um, For growing? His, for growing for cannabis, plant. yes. His sentence was commuted by President Clinton on his last day in office. Okay. Well, it's so, only fair. I mean, Clinton smoked pot. So right. He He's talking to our farmers right now across the state of Florida, telling them about, you know, the benefits of growing hemp and how easy it would be and what a boost to our economy yeah. it would be. And there's, that's the way. you got to talk to people. One-on-one. -on -one. One-on-one. -on -one and let it see it's me, it's you, it's... It's not some crazed guy it's in not, Mexico. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. not the guy that's chewing your face off, uh, you know, under the bridge in Miami on bath salts. Yeah, it's, you know, right. yeah. it's a whole different group of people. Yes. And, uh, we definitely got to get the word out to our mm -hmm. seniors because they're the ones that vote. Could benefit too. And they can benefit the most for all these medicines that they are starving to so they can buy medicines when... They could grow Cannabis, their own medicine you and can be eat much it, more affordable. Uh, you can consume it. So edibles, um, you can get all the benefits from edibles, not have to smoke it. Okay. So. Yeah. So you don't have, I guess that's, that's the sad thing. You've got people that can barely, and I know this the condition, you know, I've lived up in Illinois, northern Illinois, and you, do, you know, you had to, there were elderly people that generally, that literally had to decide, do I want heat? Do I want my medications? Do I want food? I don't have enough money for my Social Security. Little old ladies that have to decide because they have $400 worth of medications they've got to take, whereas if they could grow their own, and I'm not saying that's going to cure everything or be for, you know, every not single for thing, everyone. but, but if, it, you know, if it is, then, you know, it just... Yeah, well, I was going to say, kind of backtracking to, mm -hmm. you know, the pharmaceutical, yeah, pharmaceutical companies being like, you know, hey, this is going to hurt us. I don't think many people know that the federal government has actually put a patent on cannabis as... Um, I guess we could say a medication because of its neuroprotecting qualities. You know, right now... So they have a patent? They do have we a actually, patent. We actually do have a patent. Um, oh, great. Right now, it's listed under Schedule One of the 1970 Controlled okay, Substances right. Act, okay. meaning that it, ha it has a high potential for abuse and no known medical treatment. You know, and that's coming straight from Code Title 21, Chapter 13. And that's what they're categorizing as, even though we've discussed that it, that's not the fact. Even they're lumping it in with heroin, they're lumping it in with methamphetamine, they're lumping it in with crack cocaine, they're lumping it in with cocaine. Mm -hmm. You know, albeit cocaine does have some medical uses, right. you and know, as a vasoconstrictor. Right, you'll see it's legal there. Yeah. U.S. patents 6,630,507 cannabinoids as a neuroprotectant and an antioxidant. I would consider both of those medicine. So, in other words, they're patenting it as a drug so they can sell it. But, but at the same time, they're saying it has no medical use whatsoever. And then they also had their compassionate use investigator, investigatory, I always got that wrong, drug program, where they're sending joints to people to see what the medical benefits are. You know, it doesn't make any, Irv Rosenfeld, mm. you know, Maybe. they send him a huge tin of joints. He smokes them. It helps him, I think he was... Um, Bone cancer. Yeah, it can't. That was going to say that's right. a biggie. I know people that have cancer that you know they just, it just really alleviates the pain. And it's well, like Edie's been getting it since people that it's cruel. Since 1984, Edie's been getting it from the government mm -hmm. for glaucoma. She okay. is one of the first patients, I believe, to get it. And in the state of Florida, we were the first ones to allow medical cannabis our state? use. Our state. But but here we, we are. We're somewhere in the end of the line. So okay. So, yeah, and what is it, 16, 18 states, it's legal for medical use. And then, I mean, Colorado, we've already discussed, is raking in the dough on the taxation for it being legal. Um, and I, I guess we're, we're getting, running out of time, so I want to make sure everybody gets what they want to say in again. But um, the fact that, um, you know, I, we've got this, right, you will see people at public places like the library or the post office or somewhere with these petitions from Florida Cannabis to make medical marijuana legal in this state. And you know what? I'm seeing people signing it like crazy. You know, so it's and the people of all ages, and I understand there's 800,000 800, signatures already, and they need, they, the more than they need it, and some are saying a million, but you know, that's... It's always nice to have a little over. But you gotta have, you gotta have over because it will be, it's, it's put in a category like, let's now, let's fight it. Like what you were saying about our attorney general, She's not for it. You know, so. with, with all due respect to her, too, I respect the job that she has. And, yeah, you know, I respect her position, too. But, you know, if, if you're going to attack something, 
you know, like it says very clearly who would govern it, what right. the circumstances would be. You know, mm -hmm. you don't want to be calling out something that doesn't need to be called out on. Mm -hmm. You know, like I understand that she might, she might be getting pressure. No one knows. Right. But at the same time, you know, I feel like she's ignoring the plight of thousands of Floridians who need access to medical marijuana. Myself, I'm taking a medication right now for my irritable bowel syndrome that's made me pass out at the wheel of my car once. You know, luckily I was still in park and I wasn't so, driving. Yeah, so... But for me to be able to have a non-psychoactive strain of it that could help alleviate my irritable mm -hmm. bowel syndrome, I would love that. Yeah, and, and, and you're saying... And, and the, 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 what runs through this whole thing is when we talk about like the attorney general. I don't for a second believe that the attorney general has strong feelings about this or that. They want to get reelected. So and it's just they're going with they're the doing. flow. I saw a Jack Abramoff who was uh, a uh, lobbyist mm -hmm. and he was put in jail and he came out and he made a statement and he said that out of everybody. Uh, this time was about four years ago, whatever. Everybody in Congress and the Senate, there was only like one person he would tell lobbyists, don't go to. And that's a shame that we only yeah. would have, say, one or two people in our Congress and our Senate that you can't buy off. Yeah, like maybe, I and mean, they're probably gone now, too. They, but, they are. Kucinich or something. Yeah. And, okay, one more minute. We're going to wrap up. You got something final you'd like to say there, Jesse? Um, it was yeah. just back to Kathy Jordan, how they are agreeing now that she does need it for medical purposes. They are just not able to figure out how they can get it to her. Okay, well, you know, and I guess the thing is, is we've all, if we've got, you know, 16, 18 states that already have it legal is medical, I think we have something to work with there. There's already, we can look at what they're doing and, and do it, you know, emulate, and, okay, maybe we don't want to do everything the state's doing, but let's do what, you know, a combination that works for Florida. So now, with the shortage of time, I'd like everybody to have a chance to say, like, your website, and, uh, re you know, and, and last final word. Um, uh, you can find out a lot about um, what I'm into is Florida can, okay. and I'm a patient, not a criminal. We okay. do court support, and you can find that information on medical benefits, and if you're arrested, some medical strategies. Okay. 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 And I'm with uh, LEAP, which is Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. And if you go to leap.cc, L-E-A-P.cc, that's the website. You can find speakers, you can find uh, presentations, and uh, you can find the mission statement there. Um, there's a wealth of information. You will find that there are quite a few law enforcement uh, officials and retired and active that uh, are not for this, uh, you know, the against prohibition of uh, you know, cannabis. So that, and then that is like lawyers, judges. Lawyers, um, judges, you'll find officers. correction officers, detectives, police officers, mm -hmm. drug enforcement agents. Uh, they, they mostly yeah. retired because yeah. it's difficult. Right, but yeah. It's a very good organization. But you, with a retirement, it shows you had experience you, and you can make a, you know, a qualified decision. Correct. And yes. And for me, um, you can look us up on the internet, National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. We have our Facebook page, which is the same thing, just with Tampa in front of it. And I'd just like to thank everybody that signed petitions up until now. You are truly doing great things. And for those that might be watching this and feel like, you know, I'm not smoking or I don't smoke, so why should I fight for this? You don't need to smoke to be normal. Your help can give life to thousands of others. Right. It's freedom in this country. And uh, it says penalties for the possession of drugs should not be more damaging to an individual than the use of the drug itself. And that was by Jimmy Carter, 39th president of the United States. So I, I guess that's the, the big conclusion is that, you know, we are a country of freedom. And we should respect that for everybody to have that choice. And we say freedom of choice, but you can't have any choices. You know, it's kind of like, and, and with my party being that, you know, you, you, people think, well, there's only you can get one or two candidates. You know, it's like a Democrat or Republican has to be that way. We're trying to say, no, it doesn't have to be that way. You can make the choice. And I'm not saying that everybody has to vote for us, but I think if you, if you do, you, you might be surprised how good it would be. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming.